Hello everybody, welcome to Documentary Film Production Masterclass Week 4, B-Roll and Additional Filming. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, this is going to be the last of our four-week uh, journey in uh, documentary filmmaking. And as promised, we're going to finish up with uh, a, a look at B-Roll. And we, we should be familiar by now with A-Roll, uh, which is your main footage or your interviews and uh, generally interviews, and then your B-roll, which is all the other footage that you need to, um, you know, to help tell the story of the documentary. So that's what we're gonna be looking at today, is what is B-roll, types of B-roll, how to achieve the B-roll, and I'm gonna have some samples of some uh, projects, uh, documentary films that I've worked on, and that will, uh, at least we can have a, a, you know, a discussion of you know, what to look for, how to do it, and best practices in achieving the B-roll because it's, it's quite important. Your interviews are great, but to really have a great engaging documentary and you know, something that uh, sometimes subjects can be complicated and complex and, um, and you know, it's a visual medium. And if we just had the interview, I mean, we're basically, we could be doing a podcast, which is great, a whole other type of a documentary, but to do a film documentary, what's really, really crucial are the visual storytelling components. B-roll being one of the most important things. How do you illustrate what the person's talking about? How do you illustrate your topic and your subject? So that's what we're gonna look at today. How do we illustrate that? How do we tell that story in the best possible way? Let's have a look at that. Okay, so just wanna thank all our uh, partners in this project again. So we have the Canada Council for the Arts. Then we have our library partners, Blue Mountains Public Library, Collingwood Public Library, Wasaga Beach Public Library. So I just want to mention again, you can, uh, you can access equipment to film your documentary produ uh, productions with. We have the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera at the Blue Mountains uh, Public Library, also at the Wasaga Beach Public Library. We have Canon 6D DSLR or uh, photography, uh, digital photography cameras that can shoot video as well. Those are available at all three libraries. So you can just take it out. All you need is a valid library card at each, you know, at one of the libraries, wherever you're a member of, and then you can sign things out. Now, the other thing is you need to complete a proficiency test. It's online through our website, tbmcs.ca. Uh, check out that website, go to the bottom, you'll find the proficiency area, uh, finish the proficiency test, and then we review it. Usually within a couple of days, we can get back to you. And then uh, we, get, we get in touch with the library that you're a member of to let them know that uh, to add your access to that specific piece of equipment. Proficiency tests are, are great because uh, you, you know, it kind of goes over everything, it's a refresher, and it just, you know, it's a great reference. You can always go to it, even if you've already passed it, you can always go to it and review it because it has everything in one place, all about the specific pieces of equipment. So it's a great refresher as well. Our YouTube channel that you can access through our website as well, Tons of videos, all the tutorials, all the stuff about all the equipment that you can imagine. Um, you know, I, we, you know, whether it's myself, another instructor, we demo through, we talk about how to use it and, um, and it gets you going. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, just email me, tom at tbmcs.ca if you have any questions and I'll put that up in the chat as well. So always, uh, you can always uh, reach me that way. So about this project, uh, this workshop, any projects you're working on, um, and also the equipment access, uh, you know, things like that. Now, what's exciting is as we get into more reopening, the, all the libraries, all our library partners have digital arts computer workstations. There, um, there are uh, iMac uh, computers that are designed for video editing, and we have them loaded with uh, DaVinci Resolve Studio. So this afternoon, if you haven't joined us yet, we have the documentary editing part four, the final. Do sign up. You can also then rewatch parts one through three. And, and I take us uh, through the whole process of uh, how to put together a short documentary film in the editing process. So if you're doing this, enjoying this production part, uh, make sure you check that out as well. If you haven't been able to join us um, and sign up for that, uh, no worries. We will be posting all of these on our YouTube channel. Uh, in the next within the next week as well at the end of the month so that's all great news updates for everyone okay so let's jump into this b-roll and additional filming what does this mean and uh you know what does it look like and and how do we do this so we're going to look at uh, today we're going to look at types of b-roll uh b-roll pre-production and just like we talked about pre-production in the documentary and getting things ready to make sure that you can film uh it's really important to figure out b-roll pre-production because it's, it can be really complicated as well. It's not just a matter of, you know, you might have something, uh, it's about, let's say, peanuts. So then you can just buy peanuts, film peanuts, and that's it. 
but there's still pre-production. You still have to make sure you go and purchase the peanuts. You have the right type of peanuts. When are you going to film it? You need to have equipment. Do you book the camera out and so on? So it's not just, uh, you know, sometimes you don't want to take it for granted. So I want to uh, stress the, the importance of that. And then we'll look at the different types. So, um, you know, we'll go into in-depth uh, reviews of establishing shots, insert shots, archival and stock footage, recreating scenes, uh, history or moments. So, you know, recreation concepts and then follow up interviews. And, uh, and then we'll end with final post-production prep. What do you need to do to have everything ready for post-production? Um, so that's up. Okay. So types of B-roll and I just, you know, these are I, you know, I don't want to say this is a definitive list of everything, but this is the, the general types of B-roll that you'll encounter. And, and again, you, you can probably expand on this further, but this is, this is what I went through. We know what kind of B-roll am I usually looking to capture? This is what I came together um, of a, a list in my own experience. So establishing shots, you know, just like any kind of uh, filmmaking, establishing shots help to tell us where we are. So it could be buildings, towns, you know, town signs. So let's say you're in town of the Blue Mountains, you get a sign of that, a shot of the sign that says town of the Blue Mountains. So you establish where you are. Uh, it's, let's say the film's about the ski, uh, skiing on the Niagara Escarpment. So you'd want to get a shot of the uh, Niagara Escarpment. Even if it's in the summer, you can still establish that you're in the Niagara Escarpment region, for example. You can establish a house or a business. So let's say the interview's at someone's house. Uh, you might want to establish where it is if the house is important um, and the business is. You might want to establish a vehicle. Let's say, you know, something's, uh, uh, it's about the vehicle. You might want to get that kind of wide establishing shot. So it's kind of these wider shots, establishing where we are. And that could be really important for the storytelling because the more you can establish where you are, the easier it is to get the audience to understand uh, where you are at, at uh, uh, visually. Like where, where are we located and where, where is this thing happening? Now, just a note on the establishing shots, I think what's really important, as I mentioned here, homes, businesses, what, what you want to avoid, and I think it's a, a, a good courtesy, is to avoid actual street numbers. So if you're in someone's house and they're, you know, number 123 Jones Avenue, then, you know, avoid showing exactly what the address is. If you can just have the house, um, and then that could always be blurred out in editing or something like that. But if you can just avoid the house number and not necessarily show it, I think it's important to to uh, preserve the, the person's privacy in general. So I always try and avoid that in the shots is to not show the numbers and street names. So at least it's hard to know exactly where you are so that people don't necessarily go, hey, I'm gonna go visit this person now I know where they live, right? So think about that privacy aspect. Same with businesses, sometimes the number's really big and uh, they want that for advertising. So, you know, but if it's a smaller business or they're dealing with, let's say, I don't know, a jeweler that's, in kind of a, a more of a hidden area to prevent from theft and things like that. You wouldn't want to be like, hey, this is where the person is. Um, and then you can also get into some areas where maybe your documentary is about something more controversial. Like in the past, if there was, you know, like a, I don't know, a illegal marijuana, a medicinal marijuana uh, farming facility, and, you know, you had access to it, you're filming. Again, you wouldn't want to reveal where you are because it's important to the documentary. You're telling the story, but again, by revealing it, it could have repercussions legally or criminally for the, the people. So there are those types of things. In documentaries, you could be profiling something that is like a criminal enterprise. And, you know, you just want to think about what, what are you uh, revealing. Or maybe someone's uh, a victim um, and they're, uh, you know, trying to hide from abusers or attackers or something. So again, that same idea is like just, I think, uh, anonymity and uh, uh, privacy is uh, really important in these establishing shots. Okay, so uh, insert shots, that's the next big type of thing. So items related to the subject or interviewee filmed, they can be filmed or photographed. So usually items like, for example, big one, like if someone's a painter, um, you would have insert shots of their paintings. For example, if someone designed hats, you have insert shots of their hats. If someone's a uh, it's a profile about a, a dentist that has discovered a new process in dentistry. You'd want to have shots of that dental equipment and so on. Um, you know, same with the, some sort of science or vehicles. Someone designs cars, models, models cars that are then designed into full-scale cars. You'd want to have shots of those models, right? So on and on and on. So insert shots that are specifically related to the subject. Uh, it could be documents. Maybe they have, you know, secret documents of something. They have um, a historical... 
uh, photographs, papers, like that could be related to that. So that kind of takes us to the next thing. And there's a, like the archival footage. And these are more of the, uh, you know, and, and these, these blur, like these go, you know, these can be, an uh, inter shot can be an establishing shot, right? But just, just the, the generalization here uh, for illustration purposes. So archival footage could be film, video, photo, sound recordings. And again, these are from archives, literally, like from, you know, when you have museums and archives, the archives are the, the uh, history of a, of a certain town or city or place. So you're getting uh, archival film or video. Uh, let's say there was a specific event or a parade um, or, you know, something happened, uh, photos of schools, and you're trying to show students and who was in a school, that kind of stuff. So the archival footage is, uh, is that. So it's old, uh, older historical archival footage from archives. And it's, uh, you know, usually, um, you know, key to any kind of historical type of documentary. Stock footage, the next thing where it could just be sourced uh, elements. So sourced uh, film, video, photos, music, or sound recordings, I should say too. Um, so any kind of stock stuff. So that could be stuff you're just purchasing. So for example, if uh, someone's talking about the, the um, uh, I don't know, rainforest, they visited a rainforest. You know, you're not probably going to be able to just kind of pick up and go and vi visit a rainforest in terms of a budget, but you can probably purchase a stock piece of stock footage that uh, could cover that. So it really helps with that. Recreated scenes uh, with the interviewee performing something specific to film. Uh, you know, let's say they're you know they're going to work or going to an event, their artistic practice, their process. Then you can get into things like recreating historical scenes. So recreating something from World War I and you know, showing that. And then dramatic scenes of things that happened in, in the past. So that could just be with actors. So uh, different varieties of that. So that's the different types. Okay, so B-roll pre-production. So this is, I think, an important thing. So just as in the, there's pre-production when you start your main interviews and, and your principal photography of your uh, documentary, it's just as important and crucial for B-roll because if you think about it, some shots will require specific times of day. You don't know, think about a sunset over a beach um, or, a, you know, sunrise, things like that, or, you know, best something that happens at a specific time, like a, a clock tower at noon has a, a, some sort of animated mechanical process that birds dance around, right? You need to be there for noon to get that kind of a B-roll shot. You can't show up at 1230. You can't show up at, um, you know, you have to be there before noon to make sure you get the, the, the shot. Others could require permission to film. So if you think of workplaces or public spaces, so, you know, you're going to a library, you want to get a shot of the library, you, you should have permission from the library to film there because it's a public space. And same with the work, workplace. You can't just show up and be like, I'm just filming this person. You know, they, they work at a bank. You can't just show up at the bank and say, I want to film my interview subject working at the bank. So that's that pre-production. You need to make sure it's cleared. They're happy to let you go in there um, because a lot of workplaces don't just want you filming randomly, right? They want to know what it's for, what are you doing, what, are, what kind of shots, and they might want to say, well, why don't we use this, this area and not show these people? And again, back to the privacy. You might, you, know, they might not, you might not be able to film other people working there and that kind of stuff. Now here, recreations, they could also include actors to dramatize the scene. And then you need to start thinking of that. You need to hire actors, cast the actors, find a location, even getting a, a larger film crew. So you might need more people to produce those specific scenes. And then a big thing is just like when you, you know, get your sound equipment. So again, with our library partners, let's say you book uh, the, the video, the film camera, cinema camera, and then you have like a microphone, you have a light. You gotta make sure you have that booked. So same with B-roll, you can't just show up and be like, you know, expect that everything's going to be there when you need to go and film the clock tower at noon. You got to make sure you book your camera, you know, like the week before, have it ready, charge your batteries, all that stuff. So getting everything ready. And, you know, and then if you have to source or rent things, and again, ensure that you have that prior to scheduling a B-roll filming day. So if you need to get a, a, an artist specific paintings that you want to film, outside the Arboretum Park in front of the trees because they paint specific types of trees. You, you, fine, you can go to the Arboretum, you can have your equipment ready. So you've you know, got permission to film in the Ar Arboretum, you have your equipment ready, and then you need the paintings, right? So again, it's not all just gonna magically happen. So that pre-production is really, really important. 
um, and and you know being uh, uh, having everything ready because it could just be a big waste of time to have equipment and you don't necessarily have the elements there. So you have to always make sure you know that that everything's uh, you know pre pre planned, scheduled, and so on. Um, again, never assume anything in, in production. I think that's really, really an important takeaway. Okay, establishing shots. They can be very quick, um, you know, to film, uh, but oftentimes we, we forget them. When we're doing documentaries, we're really focused as documentary filmmakers and the interviews and maybe like insert shots, but we forget sometimes the establishing shots. And they can be really great. And, you know, the best practice I just note here is that you know, try to grab them as you're doing your, your interviews. So if you're at someone's house and you really want to show that they live in a uh, solar-powered, off-the-grid house, you need to establish that. So why don't you film that? Or at least know that, okay, I'm going to come back and schedule and film that another day. Let's say it's raining. You want to do your interview, you come back another day. Best practice, film those as you go. And especially if you're establishing building, locations. Let's say you traveled to uh, Orangeville. You're in Orangeville, you're doing interviews but you want to establish you in Orangeville. You don't want to go and film the interview, drive to Orangeville, uh, or you, you know, let's say you go to, you end up in um, Vancouver and you're doing an interview there. And, and then you don't want to have to, you can't go there, let's say fly, take a train, drive, and you shoot your interview and then you need to establish Vancouver. And so you, know, you need to film those things as you go. That's really the best practice because it could become that much of a travel point. Um, so even if you're, let's say you're, it's a half hour drive somewhere, that's, a, a, you know, an extra hour plus filming that you have to do another day. But if you're already there, you can maybe get the establishing shots in, in as little as five minutes while you're there. So do that. If there's a long list uh, that you've established, right, like before, uh, figure out a pre-production for B-roll. So you can schedule shooting these specific shots over one or more days. Maybe you need to have the sun, sunrise over Collingwood. So you need to schedule that time and figure it out that uh, you know you, you have a few hours to capture a, a sunrise, like an hour or two. Um, so well thought out establishing shots can really enhance a documentary. And uh, that could be through, you know, to do time lapse type of work. You can do these uh, different times of day, um, really showcasing the area. I think one of the most interesting things is that documentaries, and if you think about films in general, they, they often let us travel around the world. So we can go to places and, and foreign places, uh, distant places, sometimes even just, uh, you know, across the province somewhere uh, by showing people where you are, what the town's like, that you feel like you're on this journey with the, with the, in the film. And it's, that's a really cool engaging part is that when I'm like, okay, I'm watching, I'm like, oh, this is really neat. This is what this town looks like. This is, they have a lighthouse. There's a lighthouse just like we have a lighthouse and you start to think all these parallels and here's the people and, and this is what the community is like and what and you get a sense of of being there and that's the real fun part when you get to like travel so think about it's not hard to get establishing shots but they really really can enhance uh, your documentary and that's why I put them first as something that's often forgotten um, and it's a great tool to, to add in and sometimes you know I, I don't even grab a lot of them and you know, then I, then I go back and go, oh, wow, you know, a few establishing shots really do help. And it's, it's great to do it that way. So another thing to hear, establishing shots can be also sourced as stock footage. So more on that shortly. So now in, you know, with today's times and, and uh, travel restrictions and things. So maybe you're doing a remote interview and you film someone, uh, you know, like over a video conference uh, film, filming them and, and recording them. And you're going to use it in that manner or just their audio. You know, and, and again, like I mentioned, like Vancouver. So, you know, maybe you can't get out to Vancouver. It's Montreal or something. And, you know, why not just source some stock footage? And then you can have uh, establishing shots through your stock footage. And that could work really well. Okay, the next type, insert shots. Uh, type, this type of B-roll helps to illustrate details of a subject. Uh, it, they can include pieces of art, a logo. Uh, let's say an extreme close-up of a signature from a historical document. So these things can be oftentimes, you know, people, when you're interviewing them, they might bring something. So you can film these during the interview session. You can also schedule them for a B-roll filming session. So let's say, again, it's a painter. They have 200 paintings. You don't really want to, you know, make someone, you know, sit around while you do that. So you can try and schedule it. Like, why don't I, you know, come back to your studio. We can film the 200 paintings. You might want, you know, to bring more lights for that or different equipment for, to do that kind of stuff. So consider those options. You can do them. Uh, best practice, uh, consider, you know, what's available at the interview. Uh, and then it, it just be ready. Uh, you know, this happens all the time. Someone brings some items. Here's this great photo 
that they want to, you know, film, they bring to the interview, and maybe they travel from a distance and you can't really get to them another day, film it. Uh, you know, it's a lost opportunity to not film it. Try to figure out how to film it, get a nice background. We talked about that in the, in the you know, setting up your shots and, and backgrounds. And pre-plan. Again, if B-roll, uh, you know, if, that, if that's really important and necessary, you know, and, and you think the person might bring something, always consider they might bring something. And just be ready to film that and uh, have, you know, whatever kind of lights and things that you need to, to do that. So if you're already filming an interview, you can very easily film an insert shot, probably with your same kind of setup. Again, just think about visually where it is. Um, get a good spot for it. If you're not sure, try to find a really blank like table, wall, anywhere where you can pin it, where you can get a really clean thing. Don't put it on a pile of uh, magazines because then all of a sudden it's useless. You know, you want a nice clean background at a minimum if you're doing that. Okay, archival footage. So now you're starting to source existing archival, historical footage, photos, sound recordings. So it could be, you know, historical speeches, sound recordings like that. Uh, and it's really usually a major part of any kind of historical documentary. So if you're going back, and I made I made a mention here, it could be go, you can go back 100 years, you can go back 10 years, right? So whatever uh, you're working on. So obtaining and sourcing the archival footage, it's really important, again, to tell that story going back in time. You can source them sometimes. This archival stuff can be from the interview subject. They can have home movies or films uh, that you know archival materials in their collection. So photo albums, family photo albums. And, you know, archives, they're an extremely valuable resource, uh, you know, and the actual archive. So, you know, like think of the Toronto archives or museum archives, right? They're, they're the source where you can find this kind of stuff. So there'll be information on, you know, Toronto from uh, 1850 and you want to get photos, let's say, from, from that period or paintings or, you know, there's always going to be archival materials preserved of that time. Um, and then here's just a note. So getting an on-camera release statement is really important again. So if your subject's like, oh, here's my family photos, get them to say, you know, on camera that they give you permission to use those photos if you don't have a, already a document stating that, that they're, you're allowed to do that. So it's highly recommended and, it's, you know, definitely a must if you're doing for commercial uh, documentary and festival use. You want to have that covered. So always think about that. Make sure you get someone to sign off on that. And also the archives, make sure that you're allowed to use the materials. There could be additional fees or additional copyright. It doesn't mean that it's just an archive, it doesn't mean that it's uh, in public domain. There could still be copyright, it's just in their archive collection. So that's something to consider. Stock footage, so here's the great thing. Stock footage, you basically, you purchase, or sometimes it's even free, but you purchase it, and then you have the rights to use it in your particular film. So sourcing, it can be really great for the establishing shots. Like I said, again, if you need to establish where, hey, we're in Mo old Montreal, I need a shot. This person lives there, a restaurant owner. I'm doing a documentary film about, uh, you know, restaurant businesses in, in old Montreal. Uh, did it as a video conference and I want to establish that I'm, that, you know, where this person is. So go, you go online, you find stock footage of old Montreal, you purchase it and there you go. And right now, you know, travel can be expensive and complex. And a stock shot of Hawaii, uh, you can just purchase it. You don't need to travel to Hawaii, although it might be nice. We might all want to go to Hawaii, but you can purchase it. Maybe it's 50 bucks to a couple hundred bucks, uh, depending on the source, quality, and the rights. So some have limited rights. Could be web use only, television, theatrical. So just consider where your film is going to play. So again, it goes back to that beginning. Knowing what you want to do with your documentary uh, is quite important. So, you know, try to get as, as full rights as you can. Oftentimes it's, you know, full rights, no problem uh, for some things. Some things are more expensive. So there's certain, you know, uh, certain sources are more expensive as stock and, and some things are more rare. So you can get into a lot of money. You know, you can pay $500, you can pay $10,000 for stock footage. So again, depending on the source quality and the rights that you need. Um, so always, always shop around a little. You can find different things. Sometimes the same clip even can exist in different stock libraries. So that's what I've found. And think about alternatives. Maybe, you know, one shot looks great and you find something that's very similar. If it's just as good and it works for your story and you're on a limited budget as an indie filmmaker, it's always great to just go with that. Like why not, uh, you know, uh, go 
in a, in a uh, you know a more of a budget friendly manner. If you can find something similar, then go with that uh, similar uh, context of, of the stock footage. Now, stock footage can also include archival. It gets a little bit crossover again. So, stock footage uh, sources. Um, they sometimes they sell family footage, or vacation, home movies, footage from races or events. So it's kind of like archival. So you know, in stock libraries, you might find things from like the '60s uh, uh, home films that someone's posting and selling, and that could be great. So that could be a, a way to just purchase someone's home movies um, that can work to showcase some a specific area. And I'll have a demo of that. I have some uh, films that we'll look at. Okay, so recreating scenes, history, moments. So recreation. Sometimes we think of that they're just dramatic. And you know you have actors, you're doing all this. So that's that's one type of recreation where you do this dramatic recreations. But sometimes we just need to recreate the daily life, the daily schedule of the person we've interviewed and, and the subject. So you know they're traveling to an event, they're getting ready, uh, getting dressed, and so on. Maybe the event already happened, but you want to show that they're getting ready, putting on a, a fancy gown, they're going to a gala. To get into a limo, all that kind of stuff. So that sometimes we need to recreate that because if we weren't there for that specific event, but you could be recreating, you know, just redoing something that the person did to help tell the story. Now you can do it with the subject. Sometimes people don't want to be uh, in those recreations, and then you work with actors to recreate it. Maybe it's a story from 30 years ago. Uh, the person went to this gala, and then something happened. They met someone, and then they launched their uh, their career as a chef. Um, so you need to recreate that. So you you know you cast someone that looks like the person. They're younger and that kind of idea. So those are those are those kinds of samples. So they could be recreations just within your film. They could be going back. Uh, they could be dramatizations of historical battles, crime scenes. Now remember, once you get into dramatic scenes, especially when you get into period recreations. You need actors, you need costumes for that specific period, locations to look like that specific period, for example. And here's where pre-production is key and budgeting is also important. You need to look at what does that cost to do and maybe there's some alternative stock footage or archival footage that you can use that's less expensive. So if you're going back, like let's say a gallery opening in the 80s, and you're like, hey, I wanna recreate this and you look at your budget, it's $5,000. Then you look at, there's a gallery opening uh, stock footage shot from the 1980s that could work to illustrate the same story point and that's a thousand dollars then you got to look at is it worth five thousand dollars for me to do that or is it worth just getting the stock shot of a thousand dollars then that comes into a whole other questions you know style wise do you want it to be filmed a certain way you know and just think about what's what's within your budget right so sometimes the budget takes it maybe the the stock footage shot is fifty dollars that's a huge difference $50 versus $5,000, right? So you have to always consider those options and think about that um, as you go through it. Okay, then uh, follow-up interviews. Sometimes new information arises. So you've done all your interviews and uh, or you've researched and you need to do a follow-up. So maybe you've already interviewed the person and you, know, you need to follow up and, and really figure out something that you've learned about this particular subject and you need to do a follow-up because you didn't ask them those questions initially. This happens all the time. It's nothing, don't, be, don't feel like you've failed or you've made a mistake. Follow-ups are great. So again, we always wanna have everyone feeling comfortable. Uh, you know, you've left on a good note. You've, you didn't leave uh, <laughs> you know, empty food containers in the person's the living room or something. So you know, if, if everything's gone well, it should be quite simple to, to follow up and try to get that. Aim to do that as soon as possible. Sometimes people become less interested in being in the film. If it's still fresh, they might say like, yeah, I'd love to do some follow-up questions and let's do this right away. The sooner you do it, the sooner it's possible. If it starts to become you know, several months later, you might not be able to do it. They might get busy, they might go away. Your film might already have to be completed. You're, it got into a festival, you have to deliver it, and you don't get an opportunity to do that. Uh, alternatively, sometimes you can even do a follow-up as a, um, you know, an audio follow-up if you do a phone call or a video conference or things like that. So um, yeah, let's have a look at, uh, I'm gonna show some samples here. So uh, I'm thinking um, establishing shots. Uh, I'm gonna sh just grab one more uh, film here. And I think, you know, the establishing shots can be a, a really interesting thing of, you know, where are we? Um, and, uh, you know, what, is, what does it mean um, to establish? Like, where, what kind of location are we in? 
Um, and uh, so I'm just going to show, I got this, uh, this trailer I'm going to show of a film called Niagara Escarpment um, that I, uh, that I shot and, uh, and produced. So let's, let's have a look at this, this trailer because it's going to have a bunch of establishing shots. So let's give this a look. Well, the importance of the Niagara Well, the importance of the Niagara Escarpment, it's a world biosphere. Very few places in the world have an escarpment. Today, everybody can walk all 900 kilometers of the Bruce Trail. Essential to this is the maintenance of a continuous natural corridor so that wildlife can move back and forth. It's really, truly important to teach our children what came about, why this is so precious. Okay, perfect. So you can see um, how important all those establishing shots are. Like, where are we? So without establishing the Niagara Escarpment, you know, those those are key and not just like the inserts of like small symbols and there's a map inserts and things like that as we get into it. Um, but you know, that's a good thing too. There's the graphics and things in, in terms of the, uh, you know, editorial. So you might get into inserts of maps and images and things like that, uh, photographing them or filming them, but you can see how important uh, it is to get those, uh, those establishing shots going. Um, so then on, on, you know, what, what are insert shots? So I'm going to play this, uh, this next clip is um, uh, from Craig Leith Fossils, and uh, this will give you an idea of uh, inserts of, uh, of uh, shots for the documentary. Fossils. Um, the term fossil comes from the Latin word fossa, which means something like a hole in the ground. And it has come to mean the preserved remains of living things. By convention, we say anything older than 10,000 years is a fossil. Now we come to understand fossil, uh, word fossil, will describe basically any evidence of past life that is preserved in some kind of geological medium, typically in rocks, but it could be in loose sediments, it could be in ice, it could be in tar for that matter, but the remains of ancient plants and animals or a record of their activity. Okay, perfect, so I'm just gonna pause there. So here you can see insert shot of fossils, so really close up shots, grabbing these kinds of shots. Uh, previously, uh, essentially like a stock shot, it's something that I had myself, but it could have been something that was purchased of ice. Right, so that would be an example of getting stock footage in of like ice. But you can see we have our interview, A roll, then we have our B roll, these inserts of fossils. So in situ at the, um, you know, in the water, that's where the fossils are there. And then the fossil specimens, getting those kind of insert shots specifically. So establishing shots of in situ in the water, inserts of the fossils themselves. And then thirdly, we have um, the, uh, the uh, the water establishing and the stock shots of ice and then there's uh, I think there's some map work and things like that so those are all the components are coming together here so you can imagine if we just had the interviewer sitting there talking about it fine we can visualize what they're saying but without this b-roll the documentary is certainly less engaging and the story is not being fulfilled visually because we're not getting any kind of visual sense of um, you know what what we're uh, what we're looking at um, Here's another uh, uh, a documentary uh, behind the red carpet. It's about a behind-the-scenes look at the Toronto International Film Festival and Here uh, one of the interview subjects they're getting ready and this was one of those concepts of 
recreating, getting things ready, but filming them as they're going somewhere. And then there's also getting shots of the person getting ready at a, on another day because they're really busy on the day of the event. But then we went back and said, let's pretend you're getting ready. So that's this kind of recreation idea. So let's have a look at this one. are just juggling it all. It's also making sure that our staff is doing what they need to do. I mean, we're an office of 30 people. So that's a lot of people juggling as well. Okay, so again, you can see uh, all, the, all the different uh, uh, shots. Um, so recreating, so uh, and, and Natasha um, waking up, right? We didn't film that on the day. We filmed her leaving the place, but we, we recreated those too. So we got B-roll of um, her car leaving, um, you know, recreating this, that she's on her way to the office, waking up in the morning, uh, filming some interview uh, shots, B-roll of meetings and things like that. You can see then once we're at the office and one of her uh, employees there talking about the day, getting an insert of the desk, all the stuff on it. Right after the interview, I saw that stuff on the desk. So getting a shot of that, uh, all the like, coffees, Red Bull, on the uh, the desk getting that insert shot as we go and then otherwise you know you could re recreate that too so let's say i was like oh shoot i never got the desk shot you could always put a bunch of coffee and red bull on a desk but you can see that takes extra time so by grabbing it as you go you might use it you might not but it, it keeps going so that's a great example of a recreation uh that was done for a documentary uh specifically uh that's you know just the real time uh, documentary of of, um, you know, as it, as it, as it goes. AOC um, in the British Army raised I'm entire... i to go a little bit forward here on this one. Um, I think, yeah, here's a good spot. I just want to find... Okay, so here's uh, some recreations uh, for a documentary called Swift and Bold uh, about the Queen's York Rangers. So uh, let's just give this a look. And these are some uh, historical recreations of battle uh, reenactments. Of uniforms from that time that have faded. The regiment was, uh, and these colors were revived in the 1930s. And I think that they probably had a different color sense at the time than maybe we do today. Uh, and, and perhaps selected some colors that, that look good in, in sort of an art deco a sense, uh, but maybe don't reflect the original colors either. So we know that they're amethyst blue uh, and forest green, but exactly what, what shades those colors are is, is a matter of some debate. After the American Revolutionary War, there was considerable tensions with the newly formed United States. In response to the unstable relations, John Graves Simcoe passed the 1793 Militia Act, which raised civilian militia units across Upper Canada. Three battalions were formed in the region surrounding York, the 1st York Battalion drawing specifically from Northern Young Street communities. Initially, these soldiers wore civilian clothes with a clearly visible white armband. In 1812, when war with the United States seemed imminent, the militia battalions were called to action under Sir Isaac Brock. So th this is a you know, good, good sample of uh, uh, historical recreations, inserts of, uh, of uh, museum uh, uh, weapons, and then, uh, you know, and then recreating with uh, actors, uh, marching and loading the rifles, firing them. So all of these historical recreations, then it's not stock footage, but it's all recreated. We created historical with historical um, recreation actors. 
getting uh, insert shots of specific weaponry and going on from there. So you can see how, uh, you know, visually interesting this can be. The following year, the battalions were united as the incorporated militia of Upper Canada and all soldiers were issued a red surge uniform. So, you know, a lot of fun with, with having those kinds of recreations. These are battle recreations and, you know, filming that. Um, this could be something you stage, you can go to events to get it, right? So different ways of capturing it. But that's that's that recreation, historical recreation uh, concept that that works uh, quite nicely. Um, and then uh, then getting into some stock footage, like how does, how does this kind of work? So there's a film called um, Aurora, Canada's Birthday Town. Um, uh, that I uh, worked on and here's uh, some samples of getting stock footage into a historical documentary. As Optimistic Canada entered its 100th year in style, national and international celebrations took place across the country. The highlight of the national festivities was the Montreal International and Universal Exposition of 1967 with over 54 million attendees from around the world. The town of Aurora celebrated Canada's 100th anniversary with a four-day program of events that would take place from June 15th to the 18th, 1967, and no official event scheduled for July 1st. The town's theme was March On Centennial Fun, with a ball and teen dance plan leading up to the main event, a reenactment of the Lloydtown March of the Rebellion of Upper Canada of 1837. Okay, perfect. So the, there's another example, so different shots. So you can see this one right here. This is a photo uh, animated into some movement, like people you know, kind of making it into a 3D concept. Um, and uh, stock footage prior to that from Expo 67. So you know, purchasing stock footage, sourcing that. There's some that the uh, Aurora archives had as well so using their archival source purchasing stock footage and and uh, so on so a lot of stock footage photos uh, pamphlets and then doing post-production work with them so that's all this historical stuff but you can see that blend where it's archival and stock footage in that expo 67 it's a blend of two things using some archival stuff using some purchased stock footage uh, using some photos uh, images from archives, animating photos, and it kind of goes, keeps going from there. Uh, there's also some B-roll that's shot for, as insert footage and establishing shots of the town present day uh, that was shot as well. So that's how you put, you know, kind of start to put it all together. So that's that's kind of that blend of uh, of things. Um, and I'm just looking, uh, which, what other one here do I have? Um, yeah, and then here's something, uh, one of our uh, instructors too. So here's uh, like an artist profile uh, that I did, and I just wanted to show a little bit of uh, this as well. It's a beautiful way to approach your expression and your art. It can capture realistic images, but it can also cross the boundary. Something you see here in the exhibition, super realistic, very high definition images. Uh, and on the other side you have the blurred, uh, more painterly works. There's so much richness in photography and what you can do now, that's what I love so much. I started photography uh, five years ago, uh, two years of college and then three years freewheeling. I wanted to discover what you can do with it. Because um, I have a multi-faceted interest, so I I went into the classical portraiture way with classical uh, antique printing. I did more projects that were uh, filled with uh, the whole thoughts behind it. And also I want to, I love kind of painting with your materials. So I, basically what you see is discovery of what I like in photography. Perfect. So that's uh, again an idea of there's interviews with Chawling. Many of you will recognize him from uh, the, the uh, he's our photography uh, instructor and, and very talented uh, um, artist. Uh, and so that's his gallery display. Uh, the, the focus was how do you capture his work? So you can see there's insert shots of his photographs in the gallery. 
and uh, you know uh, the interview itself, uh, and then getting some rec kind of recreations, I'll call them, or insert shots of him also just just looking at the camera um, outside of the interview. So that was kind of a recreation of you know that I was thinking more of a shot of him like as if he's looking at his own photos and his own works and and kind of that self-reflection so there's you know and, and it puts it together so you can see different ways of approaching it what is establishing shots this last shot here kind of establishing shot of the whole gallery space right and then getting the inserts of the photos themselves so that's that can be an establishing shot just showing the whole space that we're in for the interview it can work really well so that's uh that's kind of the blend of of some samples and i think that hopefully that helped to uh um you know kind of showcase what uh what, what you can do in all those different types and seeing them in action, right? So putting that together, um, and again, you can source a lot of stuff, you can shoot a lot of stuff. Uh, obviously, filming your own B-roll will always be the most cost-effective if you just take out a camera, like from one of uh, our library partners, go in and, and take shots, uh, film them. You can also take photographs of uh, and do B-roll photographs, and we have some great videos about editing photographs and, and anim animating them and making some movement with them as well. So that's a really great uh, um, an idea. So one final thing here, just to end our, uh, our workshop here, final post-production prep. So once your principal or main photography is all done and complete, it's time to offload all of your footage and to uh, you know ensure you have it all backed up. And at that point, you want to make sure you know all your raw original footage exists at least on one additional backup hard drive. So that means there's two places where your footage is, right? Your one main drive you're editing with and a total backup drive. So you know I'd like to get some sort of backup drives um, and have everything exist on the backup drive, and then it's also being edited. So in case that drive fails while I'm editing or through the computer, if it's on the main hard drive, you wanna have it all backed up here, so no problem, you can just reload. If that drive fails, you've used your backup, and then you need to make a new backup. So to get it exists on at least two locations. That's a key, key rule, always exists on two locations. Then you wanna have a log of all your interviews, B-roll, additional archival stock footage, have it all logged so you know what you have, and it's gonna save a lot of time in trying to find it later on, right? So log it all, make sure it's all there, and, and it's gonna save you tons of time later to really get that working uh, in the editing process right away. Label all your folders with dates, uh, any kind of card information, you know, like any, all the information that can help you with your editing. You can put lots of information, you can put little text documents even with logs, put it all in there in, on the hard drive. So, you know, save, if you do a log in like a, some sort of like a, a, a Word text document, Save it, even as a PDF with everything in there, put it on in with your footage. So you never have to think about where it is in the future. It's always traveling with that footage backed up and it's a log of all your stuff. And that, that's the last thing you need to do before you get into editing. Now, getting into editing, please join us 2 p.m. We, again, we have our week four of documentary editing if you haven't joined us yet. And you can, uh, if you get a ticket for that for week four, you can go back and watch uh, all four sessions, weeks one through four. And uh, that would be fantastic. So, um, yeah, just want to really, again, thank all our, uh, uh, you know, partners in this. And, and here's your last assignment. Go and film some B-roll. And this is what you need to do to complete your doc. Uh, based on your interview and subject, capture at least six different shots to include in your film. Don't just get one shot. Go and capture like six, even if it's really simple, you know, a quick interview you've done and this, the follow-up interview. It can be any type, you know, insert, establishing, maybe a recreation. Go and get your B-roll, and then you can continue to finish your two to three minute documentary film. So with this, these four assignments, you should be able to have everything done, interview, follow-up, or, or interview main, uh, secondary interview, and your B-roll, and then you're ready to go to editing. So that, that I leave you with this final uh, assignment. So again, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us on this. You can, uh, again, re-watch this. If you're on this right now, you can see the past weeks of this. Rewatch it, enjoy it, uh, you know, Try some of this stuff out. T go take out a camera. Uh, do your proficiency test if you need to. And, uh, you know, it's going to be really exciting to, to see uh, some of the films. You can send me footage. If you have technical questions, send me an email uh, and we can go from there. So I want to just, again, thank all our partners in this project, Canada Council for the Arts, and all our 
amazing library partners, Blue Mountains Public Library, Collingwood Public Library, Wasaga Beach Public Library. And don't forget to check out the equipment and I look forward to seeing you guys soon. I, uh, again, coming up right after this, we have our advanced docu uh, cinematography and uh, in the afternoon we have uh, documentary editing. So you can continue to, uh, to join us. Uh, any questions, send me an email and uh, we can have a chat about uh, any technical or equipment questions you may have. Thanks again, and I'll see you guys soon. All the best.